Good morning, everyone. It's been a minute since I've been up here, in case you forgot my face. I'm Stephanie. <laughs> um, and I just want to welcome you to church today. It's great to have you all here. And I'm excited for Thanksgiving this week. I don't know if you all are or not, but I have a three-day work week, so that's going to be awesome. And I get to eat a bunch of good food and spend time with family. So hope you all have a, a great Thanksgiving week as well. Um, just a couple announcements for those of you that uh, don't remember um, or don't know. Our Citadel Young Adult Group, we picked a, um, a group through Wycliffe to sponsor Bible translation. And the group we picked was a sign language translating group for Columbia. Um, and Columbia holds a, a special place in our heart, of course, because we took a trip there. And uh, Eric takes regular trips there. And it's just been um, just an awesome kind of country on our heart. And we thought sign language was pretty cool to translate the Bible into. But they sent us a little thank you card for our donations. Um, we give, oh gosh, 1% of every, every monthly income, I believe, um, towards that project. So it says, dear friends, our hearts are filled with gratitude for how we see God's global church partnering together to spread the good news. And you are a part of that. All around the world, more people are hearing, seeing, and reading scripture in a language and format that they can clearly understand. And when they do, they're experiencing the joy of encountering God himself. We pray that God will fill your heart with joy and excitement for how he's moving, both in your own life and in the lives of others receiving scripture in their own language, until all the nations worship. And this is from John and Kelly, who are translators with Wycliffe. <laughs> um, all right, so more announcements is um, the senior adults have their Christmas meal at Linda's Law Cantina. That is Wednesday, December 13th at 4 p.m., uh, if you want more details or if you need to reserve your spot, contact Joe Ball. And then uh, for our Christmas Eve service, Christmas Eve is on a Sunday this year, so you guys better be here all day long. We're going to be worshiping all day long. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <coughs> we have our normal um, service in the morning. It's not going to be a joint service this year. It won't be candlelight, but it will be a Christmas-themed service. And we're going to start that uh, just 15 minutes later than normal, so that'll be at 1130 Christmas Eve um, on that Sunday. And I believe that's all I've got. Um, if you are new, if we don't know you, if you're watching online, uh, we do have a I'm new contact form on our website. If you want to fill that out, it gives us a little bit of information about you. It gives us the ability to reach out to you and get to know you more as well. Uh, and you can learn more about us on that same page. You just go to our website, oasisconwaygardens.org, uh, and click the little button that says I'm new. All right, that's all I got for you guys. It's great to see you all here. And... We'll uh, get moving on in the service here. You know, five years ago, we had uh, a website that hadn't been updated in years, and we weren't on social media, and Stephanie runs all of that now. In fact, we asked her to prepare a report for us, um, I think it was a year ago around Christmas, and our online, I don't know how this is measured, the metrics, but uh, she discovered, uh, not she didn't do this herself, we asked her to check, and our online presence increased by, I think, 1,000%, and uh, Stephanie just does an amazing job. Would you guys give her a hand? Thank you, Stephanie. Um, does Christianity satisfy? Uh, in this series, we've been saying things like, well, you can't slam dunk prove that God exists, and you can't absolutely prove he doesn't exist or any gods. There, but there's good evidence on both sides of the argument. But that's the normal track most people take when having these discussions. I'm trying to do something different. Now, if you want to look at the evidence in favor of God or in favor of the resurrection of Jesus. That's on the web, on our same website she mentioned under a section called For Skeptics. Instead, we're trying to do something different in this series. I'm trying to remove what we might say more touchy-feely obstacles to even considering the faith, considering Christianity. These are subjective reasons, soft reasons. Now, that doesn't mean these are bad reasons. Um, the these are all valid factors in how we make decisions. Most of us uh, stay with our spouse or stay with our job, uh, and that 
I mean, when we make those decisions, subjective reasons come into that. <laughs> How's it going lately? Um, so we, we do use subjective knowing to make these decisions. Another way to say this, uh, uh, to say, does Christianity satisfy, we're saying, does Christianity satisfactorily explain what's going on in the world? Which belief system, if you compare, um, you might call it atheism or secularism, you might compare Buddhism, Hinduism, Islam, which belief system makes most sense? And so uh, we've tried not to make these sermons. Um, we have a Q&A time. And um, uh, let's do that now. Hold your hand up if you didn't get a card. We're giving everyone a blank card. Jack, did you pass them out before service? So down here we need some. Uh, let's get those passed out. And as you think of a question during the message, write it down. We'll also have a break between the talk and the Q&A time to remind you again to write. So in week one, we said, uh, since you can't prove God, we asked, does Christianity satisfy our sense that maybe we're not alone? Week two was a very different track, one that I think is not talked about enough in matters of faith, is, and that is, does Christianity satisfy our need for beauty and aesthetics? And all these, by the way, are on the web. They're on YouTube and on our Facebook page. Week three, does Christianity satisfy our sense of story? Most cultures really zero in on story. We explain our lives in story. We argue that God is actually the author of story, and we're living in one big story. Last week, we talked about does Christianity satisfy our sense of morality and justice? So with that, let's get on to this week. In 2005, 60 Minutes correspondent Steve Croft interviewed the famous quarterback Tom Brady. We got any Brady fans in here? I want to ask about Brady haters. I, I don't want to get going down that trail. Uh, someone said something. Um, so that interview aired in November 2005. So Croft, uh, in the interview, asked this question. With this whole upward trajectory, what have you learned about yourself, Tom? What kind of effect does it have on you? And Brady says, well, I put incredible amounts of pressure on myself. Uh, when you feel like you're ultimately responsible for the team and even when you can't control things, you still hold yourself responsible for it. You blame yourself when things don't go right. And he says, there's a lot of pressure, and a lot of times I get very frustrated and introverted, and there are times when I'm not the person I want to be. There are times when I'm not the person I want to be. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings? At that time, he didn't have the other four. He now has seven. Why do I have three Super Bowl rings and think there's still something greater out there for me? I mean, maybe a lot of people would say, hey, man, this is what it is. I've reached my goal, my dream in life. I think, God, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. I mean, I've done it. I'm 27. And what else is there for me? And Croft says, well, what's the answer? And Brady says, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. Now, I, I don't want to throw Brady under the bus. All of us go through this. He even goes on to talk about he gets a lot of meaning and positive feelings from his family and friends. Now, like I said, last week we talked about morality and justice. But we also said that even though there are objective moral standards in the world, we also said no human person can keep them all. Tim Keller, who I've based a lot of this last two talks on, uh, even went so far as to say, from a human perspective, Christianity's a failure. Because humans don't keep the rules. In, uh, we, we, uh, we really don't argue from Scripture in a talk like this, because if we're talking to people who haven't made that decision of faith, you don't uh, feel the same way about Scripture as we do. Uh, and I'm not trying to do a we versus them. But let me, let me if you'll indulge me, I'm going to mention a couple passages. There's a story in Acts chapter 15 where the, the Christian church is in its infancy stage and they're thinking about rules to make non-Jewish believers adhere to. They're coming into the faith and really a lot of early Christians were Jewish. And they're deciding whether or not to make them uh, be circumcised, and do a lot of other things that are typical Jewish rules. And Peter stands up. Now, I've got a very modern translation on this. If 
but I thought you'd like it. He says, so why are you now trying to out-God God? Loading these new believers down with rules that crushed our ancestors and crushed us too. The actual wording there is uh, by uh, why do you keep trying to put a yoke on these new friends' backs that we weren't able to bear? So trying to keep all the rules can be crushing. Trying to run a football team, even though you can't control everything, and yet when things go wrong, you face failure. And there's times I'm not the person I want to be. So, if so, how does Christianity satisfy our sense of identity? Uh, especially when we fail so much. What maintains your sense of who you are in the ups and downs of your own performance? And that performance can be just behavioral stuff that you want to stick to. Some of you know I constantly fail in my area of my diet, and I'm really frustrated about that. Or it could be real serious moral failure. It could be your sport or your job performance or your role as a spouse or a parent. So now we're talking about then does Christianity satisfy our need for an identity that can weather all that? Now, I want to be real honest. For me, this the topic of identity was really difficult for me. Uh, I was clueless. Uh, if, if you're not... Uh, someone who grew up in church, you're probably not aware, but the, the phrase, your identity in Christ, is a very popular phrase. You can hear it talked about. And I always thought, what, what are they talking about? I don't get it. I mean, I've asked Jesus into my heart. If he's forgiven me of my sins, what's this identity in Christ? Well, around 2001 to 2003, somewhere along that time, I was in a different Christian denomination, and I'm not going to mention them because I don't want to sidetrack them, us, but I mean, everything's fine, but I disagreed with a couple of things that made me feel like it was dishonest for me to stay in that denomination. So as I'm debating this decision, uh, I begin to imagine what it would be like if I just resigned my credentials. And I was shocked because the immediate emotion was fear. Who, who would I be if I'm not a, a minister in such and such a denomination? And I was like, oh, my goodness, my identity is in my credentials as a minister. So I quickly resigned them because that's not the job of those. And I began to ask myself, how do I define myself? What's my identity without saying I'm a minister or I'm a professor? Where's my value as a human come from? And so I began to understand a little bit more about identity. So to begin with, let's talk about what identity is. So Keller puts it this way, uh, three questions. To what do I aspire? What do I hope to be? What's, what's the main thing in my life that sets my goals? Number two, what is my worth? Uh, an assessment of whether or not I'm living by that main thing. So if, if, if and I don't think this is completely what Brady was saying, but just for the sake of argument, if the main thing was just football, then his worth would be determined just by football. And he's, he did say family was very important to him. But then thirdly, in, in identity, the question of who gets, to, who gets to say? Who gets to decide whether or not I'm meeting those goals in my main thing? Who gets to evaluate me? Now on the screen, you see a picture of Charles Taylor. And uh, Charles Taylor in 1989 wrote a very important book called Sources of the Self, the Making of Modern Identity. It's quite a whopper. I haven't read it. But I've done some research, and the research I did, I did through a recent uh, response to his book through a Ukrainian professor of philosophy, Vitaly Lyak. And he works at the National Academy of Sciences in Ukraine in the area of philosophy. And his article, and I'm trying not to get too eloquent here, but uh, I've got a not, lot of nice movie illustrations today, trying to stay out of the clouds a little bit. But he wrote an article called Charles Taylor's Ideal of Modern Identity in the Context of Liquid Modernity. What do you mean? He means that the modern world is constantly changing. And he identified identity in very simple terms. A person's compliance with certain guidelines and requirements of the day. 
your compliance with the guidelines around you. And we're going to see that there's two different ways that culture has set those guidelines, whether that's family or your vocation. You know, am I measuring up to what my family wants or am I measuring up to what I want to be? That's my identity. Am I complying with those guidelines? So the question then becomes, what, what do we do when we don't meet those guidelines? And you might set your value by your family. You might set it um, by other people other things, your job, but what happens when that fails you? Ironically, for Tom Brady, that interview was in 2005. In 2022, he and his wife divorced. One of the places where he got the most affirmation for his identity, it, so it seems. And his ex-wife, Giselle Bunchen, if I pronounce it that right, told BBC about the breakup, it was the death of my dream. What do you do when your dreams crash? And history, if you're a student of history, tells you most everybody will have dreams that completely fail at some point. Now, again, I'm not picking on Brady. This is something all humans face. In the 1981 movie Chariots of Fire, there's two main characters, Eric Little and Harold Abramson, or Abrams. And uh, Little is the main character. But Harold Abrams um, is also, they're both runners. They're athletes. They compete in the 1924 Olympics um, in the 100-yard dash. And then through a change of events, Little runs the 400-yard dash. But what's important for our topic is Abrams' character says this. And now in one hour's time, I will be out there again. I will raise my eyes and look down that quarter four feet wide with only 10 seconds to justify my whole existence. But will I? See, his complete identity was derived in whether or not he would perform as an athlete. Now, in, in justification to him, it wasn't all his fault. He was Jewish and living in a time of strong anti-Semitism. But his answer to that was to succeed on the sports field. Of course, he doesn't win. So who is he then? Who are you when your identity fails to live up to what you want it to be? My counselor in 2014, so I resigned my credentials with that organization a, a decade earlier. In 2014, when I finished my doctorate, and sorry, friends, those who come regularly, you've heard this story a million times, but it's too appropriate today. I had so confused my own spiritual life and my role as a father and a husband with the meticulous care I had to take with my schedule to get done with my, with my doctoral degree, that I was a wreck. Anytime I failed anything in my morals, and I'm not talking about going out and shooting people, but I had become so introspective, almost neurotic, trying to be perfect, I had to go to counseling. And finally, my counselor said, you need to repent for trusting in your own behavior and your own righteousness. I was failing and losing my identity. So who are you when you fail to meet your standards? Well, let's talk about the two main identities that Charles Taylor talks about in this book. First is the traditional identity, the traditional identity. Traditional identity comes from community, from family. Um, you are acting the way we raised you, and we're proud of you. You are in the business that we raised you to be. You are following the morals that we want you to do, and we affirm you, and we're really happy. Um, in a traditional identity, we find out what our community values, what those standards are, church, family, even state demands, and then we go inside ourselves, and we make changes in ourselves in order to comply. That's traditional identity. You could think of a lot of old movies to think about that, and I'm going to share some in a minute. But the main point is in a traditional identity, you conform to the community. If the community says you're okay, then you're okay. Here's some problems with that. What happens when your family fails you? Um, I was uh, watching a movie last night, uh, Disney, Coco. I hadn't seen it before. And the main character is Miguel, and he's in a, a Mexican family. 
and uh, he is just so gifted as a guitarist and a singer. Uh, very good. The music in this movie is, movie is very good. I have really enjoyed it. Um, but this family's identity is in being shoemakers. And they say, you can't play music because you're not a musician. You're a maker of shoes. Now, they had other negative baggage for not wanting to be a musician. But the point is, in the early part of the film, there's a early climax when he's still pushing against family, and he, his grandmother, in a fit of rage, takes his guitar and repeatedly smashes it into the ground while yelling at him. Now, what do we call that in modern culture? We call that verbal and psychological abuse. Can you imagine uh, your 8, 7, 10-year-old son being treated that way and his most prized possession being smashed violently in front of him. See, the, uh, a lot of times people think that when you have a talk like this, we're just saying the traditional view is great. No, it has problems. What happens if you don't want to be what your family wants? Now, it's good in that as long as you conform, you have a great support network. But if you don't, you are shunned and shamed and even can have total despair if you don't conform. We're going to talk about the modern identity in a moment, but the modern identity evolves from the abuse of the traditional identity. Here's another way traditional identity assigns value and conflicts. How many romance movies have you seen where the guy and the girl are not from the same social class? And Too many. And they're not supposed to get married, but you're just dying for it to work out, you know? What is the classic? I guess Romeo and Juliet are, are that. Well, I, I scratched down a few of mine. The great Gatsby. Jay Gatsby is a poor immigrant son who falls in love with Daisy Fay, later Daisy Buchanan, and then uh, Jay works to become a millionaire to be good enough to woo her from her then new husband, Tom Buchanan. And, of course, the Buchanans are high class, high society, Jay looks like he's high society, but inwardly he's still just a poor immigrant who's come up in the world. There's a class. How about Titanic? Was Rose high society or low society? Rose was high, and Jack was what? Very low society. Now, don't, don't get me wrong, folks. Some of these movies aren't appropriate for children and maybe not even appropriate for an adult. But they are common in our culture, and I'm trying to make a point with them. Pride and Prejudice. Pride and Prejudice, the most loved class romance story of all time. Darcy finally proposes to Elizabeth despite her being several ranks lower in class status. Now, the fact that so many movies hinge on this demonstrates one of the problems of the traditional identity, the inequality in class that traditional identity perpetuates and shames people when they don't uh, follow that. And we see this shaming going over and over. And if you haven't seen the movie Coco, go watch it. It's pretty good. It's, but if you stop and put that scene into real life of a grandparent flipping out and smashing a guitar over and over, you can see how jarring that would be to a kid. So what's happened? Since the Enlightenment, we've moved to the modern identity. The modern identity. The modern identity comes from within. You look inside and say, this is who I am. You've got to conform. This is who I am. I've looked inside, and this is who I am, and I deem that I am valuable myself, and you should conform. Leoc, in his article about Taylor's book, says, Freedom, individuality, and focus on inner self-expression are the set of virtues that distinguish the man of the modern era from the previous traditional oriented person. So that's freedom, individuality, and focus on the inner self. So in the modern identity, we look inside to see who we are, and then we go outside and make everyone else change to approve of us. They have to change, I don't. Now, here's another Disney. And I owe Keller for this one. I never picked this up in the lyrics. Uh, frozen. Frozen. 
in the in the title song, there's two stanzas that just compare this perfectly. Here's the traditional identity that Elsa sings about. Don't let them in. Don't let them see. Be the good girl you always have to be. Conceal. Don't feel. Don't let them know. So inwardly, she's thwarting all her conflicting desires to match what society, what her family says she should be. And, of course, she's not happy with that. Then the song, in a couple of stanzas later, switches to the modern identity. And here's how it goes. And the fears that once controlled me can't get at me at all. It's time to see what I can do to test the limits and break through. No right, no wrong, no rules for me. I'm free. Let it go. Let it go. By the way, I do like the movie. Um, by my identity as Grandpa Papa, my little Leah dictates my identity must like Chosen. If you'll get that there, that's supposed to be funny. Um, but here we see a switch from the traditional identity to the modern identity. No right, no wrong, no rules for me, I'm free. And everyone else has to change. Of course, in the movie, they do change. But seriously, there are problems with the modern identity. You can't just follow your heart. Uh, and your inward desires because your inward desires conflict with each other. They do. Um, what if you love your job and you love your significant other, but something's changing and they won't go together? Your career is going to call you to Seattle, but your significant other wants to stay in Orlando. I'm not sure why you'd want to do that. I love Seattle, except when it rains like it did the last four days. What do you do? Don't you have desires that conflict? One of my problems is I have three or four uh, parts of my life that, that do tie into my identity sometimes. Um, I love to do projects around the house. You guys have seen my Miata. Uh, I built a, a wooden porch with rough sawn cedar uh, last year. I love it. I'm also a hiker. I'm a teacher, and, and I'm a, a pastor. So which one of those helps me decide what to do on a given day? Your desires conflict. Now, I want to give you a better example of that, and again, I owe Tim Keller for this one. Imagine an Anglo-Saxon warrior in Europe a thousand years ago. We were, uh, we were in London in uh, sep late September, and they were talking about ancient Roman ruins of bridges over the Thames River. So they were there. Rome was there. So imagine one of those Roman warriors, and he's walking down the street, and he runs into someone, let's say I run into Terence, and Terence disrespects me. So being a Roman Anglo-Saxon warrior, my thought is to, to strike him down. And that's okay because that's a part of the value system, the traditional value system of the time. But let's say that same Roman warrior has a sexual desire that is not in keeping with the ethic of that day. What does that soldier do? He suppresses that value because that's not okay. So now you transfer that to, the, to a modern man. A modern man is walking down uh, a street in New York City or Orlando, and he has two desires. One, he runs into Pastor Terrence, and Pastor Terrence bumps into him and disrespects him, and he stops and thinks, I want to I let him have it. But he knows in this modern culture, if he does that, he's got a problem. But he also has an aberrant sexual desire. But in our culture, that's okay. So you have conflicting devour, desires all the time, and whether you know it or not, you're often changing yourself to comply with the, de with the guidelines of the culture around you. So the modern identity says, follow who you are inside, but you really can't just do that. Most good movies and books these days paint what we're called round characters. In the study of story, we have flat characters who never do anything different. They always do the same thing. But good, complex, round characters surprise us, and they change because they're more like real humans. They're more like real humans who have conflicting desires. Another reason the modern identity has problems is you know your flaws the most. No one is a worse critic on themselves than themselves. Constantly beating yourself up. So what we have then is a modern persona that's neurotic. 
constantly needing affirmation from other people. Leox says in his article, the modern age, commonly referred to as the postmodern age, introduces a great deal of uncertainty, uncertainty into all spheres of human existence. And that requires constant self-determination. You're constantly looking for a- affirmation. And Keller says that leads to a culture that's obsessed with sex and romance. We're constantly looking for someone else to make us feel good about ourselves because our current culture says you look inside to feel good about yourself and it doesn't work. And thus all relationships become consumeristic and transactional. I love you because what you could do for me. Now, since that doesn't work, we begin to import values from other belief systems. Well, I'm a good person uh, because I help the sweet little lady across the street. Well, why are you helping the lady across the street? Most people, not because they have compassion or their heart is soft, but because they want to make themselves feel good about themselves. Uh, two decades ago, I was the head of uh, student discipline at the university, Palm Beach Atlantic University in West Palm Beach. And we, we both upheld the rules, but we created an extremely redemptive program so that when students were in trouble, that's when we jumped in to help them. We saw students get off drugs, uh, and, and in their faith, too, we would help them. But it was only later in life that I realized my desires were mixed. I didn't just care about them, but I also wanted to be the good guy who was helping them change. So I was looking inside to validate myself, and that's a problem with the modern identity. People, in the end, are trying to justify themselves. They're trying to save themselves. So, in a way, both the modern identity and the traditional identities are crushing. One says you have to obey all the rules everyone else gives you, and you can't. And the other says, I have to obey all the desires I have, and I can't, and so it's crushing. Now, you remember I told you earlier that Leok's article, the Ukrainian professor, is evaluating Charles Taylor's work because he says our culture is liquid. It's constantly changing. Let's go to the next slide, and then we're going to wrap up. Now, typically I don't use pictures like this because of copyright issues, but I think I'm allowed. This picture is from Wikipedia. This is from the movie McClintock. Uh, I have cropped it a little bit, but I'm using it to show you something educational. I think that hits the copyright rules. I don't think I'll do that with a Disney movie thing, especially with what's going on in Florida and Disney right now. What's the bigger problem with identity? Since the values in modern identity are constantly changing, the modern identity has left us unstable and searching for something more. It pushes us for new identities. Now, I'm a a Western fan. I read Westerns. I watch them. And uh, I've thought about two or three movies for a while now. I finally get to tell you about them. Uh, One of them is The Quiet Man, where John Wayne plays an Irish boxer. You've seen it, haven't you, Ron? Not that one. Okay. I thought I was smaller. So he wants to be a, a boxer. He's Irish. The Irish are known for their temper. And his counterpart is Maureen O'Hara, the red-headed, fiery Irish woman. The point of the movie, I don't even remember the whole point of the movie, but part of it is reconciling their conflict. And in the end, what does he do with her? Does anyone know? He spanks her. How does that fly in the Me Too movement today? Not too good. Well, then the other one is this one, McClintock. And McClintock is a big cattle baron, and there's the same conflict, and she's always barking at him, and he's always, he, he loves her to death, but can't figure out what's wrong with him, with her. And in the end, he spanks her. And you can't even see it in this cropped version, but uh, they have a daughter, and her lover spanks her too, as if affirming this is the way you treat women. And everyone's loving it. They're, they're clapping. They're handing him something to spank her with. And there's a lie that our culture is perpetuating in that, is that women want to be dominated, and when they're dominated, it leads to sexual desire. In the last scene of the movie, uh, the lights come on up in the top bedroom, and they go up in the house together, and she goes, oh, GW, which is his initials, which is Hollywood's way in the 60s of intimating that they were intimate. 
that dominating her made her more compliant to intimate relations. Now, obviously, you think that's a problem, but here's a third John Wayne movie. In Arms Way, it's not a Western, but this is Kirk Douglas and John Wayne. And John Wayne plays the head of a fleet named Tory, and Kirk Douglas plays an old friend, Eddington, who becomes his sort of first officer. I don't remember the actual rank. But Eddington subscribes to this same idea of women of that time. Now, don't get confused with modern. Even though it's 50 years old, it's still a part of the modern identity. So what I'm talking about is cultural norms that we used to validate ourselves change. So Eddington's character takes out a girl on a date. She's naive but flirtatious. He misunderstands them and follows this cultural ethic, and it ends up in a rape. She later finds out or thinks she's pregnant, so she takes sleeping pills, kills herself, because she can no longer validate herself. And he, finding out she commits suicide, flies a daring suicide mission to save uh, his friends, and he supposedly redeems himself, but he's in despair as well. You see, culture changes, and looking at the culture, uh, maybe 100 years before that, I don't know, it would have been okay that he had done that. It certainly wouldn't have been o- would have been okay in 700 B.C. when Homer writes the Odyssey and the Iliad, and it was very common to capture women and raise up children through them. That was just the norm. It wasn't thought of bad as all, at all. In fact, I'll give you a modern example. Matt Lauer is the modern-day Eddington. You see, in the 70s, when the sexual revolution promoted pornography and even violence towards women in some publications, it would have been no big deal to just send some photos of yourself that are illicit to someone else. But culture changed. In a good way, the Me Too movement came about. Culture shifted back, and Matt Lauer not only loses his job, but we never hear of him. He's shamed and shunned from society. So if neither the modern identity nor the traditional identity work, and as these scholars say, we're looking for something new, what do we do? The participants, we humans are confused. And Leoch says that Taylor, when he wrote his book, had a concern about the constantly changing moral sphere in the world and that Hmm, That somehow gives the impression that there seems to be an original set of moral values. How do we get back to that? How do we, Tater said, we need a re-enchantment of original moral values. But if what we just said is true, and our society goes back to traditional values, what do we do when we don't keep them? The Apostle Peter said we even couldn't keep them. They were crushing us. And so what I'd like to do then is present to you that Christianity offers the most satisfying sense of identity. The most satisfying sense of identity. How? Well, in the Chariots of Fire, the main character, Eric Little, doesn't run for his identity. He runs for the glory of God. Secure in who he was, as God's loved, despite his performance, he ran as a gift back to God because his identity came from God. How, how in the world is that possible? Christianity is the only worldview that gives you the identity that is received, not achieved. It's the only worldview, the only ideology that gives you an identity, a affirmation system that is completely outside yourself, completely outside of society. It is received, uh, not achieved. A verse that my counselor shared with me or I don't even remember how I got it, but it became a, a passage of Scripture that really went home to me that day, is 2 Corinthians 5.21. The Apostle Paul says, For our sake, for our behalf, Jesus became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. You see, you don't have to approve. You don't have to achieve and perform because you can't. You actually are forgiven, and your self-worth becomes completely outside your performance. And it wasn't just for God's glory. Paul says says that Jesus did it for our sake. Now, that's crazy that the creator of the universe would rather die than let me suffer. 
your identity does not go up or down on your performance. It remains steady as God's beloved. Now, there are Christians who don't understand this, uh, and they're, they're fearful in the way they live. But what we see from older saints and from study of Scripture is the longer you live, the softer your heart comes and the more sensitive your moral conscience comes, you see how many times you failed. And when you see how many times you failed and the fact that God still loves you, you change. You become more secure, more convinced. Now, I've shared a lot about myself. Let me tell you about this journey. Because it takes Christians a long time to live into this. And Scripture teaches this. Scripture teaches that when you come and start following Jesus, you don't become perfect. You fail. I could share more examples of Peter's failures, and I may if I have a moment here. But I mentioned my porch that I built. I try to spend a little time in Scripture reading and in prayer most mornings. And I, I, a few years ago, I started listening to a podcast that will repeat the Lord's Prayer for me. And it was very helpful for me to have someone else lead me in that. And most of you know, the Lord's Prayer begins this way. Our Father in heaven, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. In the last few years, I can't get through that without saying hallowed be. Holy is what that means. Hallowed be your beautiful name. Hallowed be your beautiful name. It just comes from where inside. Why? Because I have been trying to validate myself, even as a Christian, on my own behavior for years and years and years and years. And then you blow up at your wife, or you look at something you're not supposed to, or you overwork or ignore your kids, and you realize what an idiot you are, but then you're reaffirmed by Christians and by the Word of God that you are God's beloved. And little by little, your life changes. And your identity grows in him. I'll close with this. The Apostle Peter, the same one who said we never could keep those rules. Earlier when Jesus, before he died, was telling them, hey, I'm going to die. And Peter said, listen, if all other 11 of these disciples run, I'll never leave you. I'll fight to the death. I'm the best. So here he's putting value in his own ability to perform. And he didn't perform. When challenged that he was a follower of Jesus, three times he denied that. And even cussed the girl out in modern terms. He really did. And as Jesus predicted that a rooster would crow, when he finally denies him the third time, it says Peter wept bitterly because he had failed. And now his identity is crushed again. But in the last chapter of John, Jesus runs into Peter after he's risen from the grave. And he says to Peter, do you love me? And Peter says in the original, uh, I'm your friend. There's a change in word there. Jesus says a second time, do you love me, Peter? Peter says, I, I, I'm your friend. He won't say it. So finally, Jesus comes down to Peter's level. Are you even my friend? And the formerly bragging Peter says, you know everything. You know I love you. And then Jesus says, go feed my sheep. You see, Peter's value in Jesus' eyes had nothing to do with his performance and only in the fact that Jesus himself loved him. And so in the end, years later, church history tells us that Peter, instead of running this time, in the mid-60s, about 30 years after Jesus uh, uh, ascended into heaven, Peter willingly died a martyr's death. Not like Eddington's character in the John Wayne film to flimsily try to redeem himself, but out of love because he was redeemed even though he constantly failed. Our identity is God's. So what we're going to do now, we're going to get ready to move to the Q&A time. And um, Terrence has got a few questions. As we said last week, we primed the pump with a few questions. I want you to take a moment and to write any questions you have. And while you're writing those, I am going to, uh, we're going to pray for those in our community that are sick and struggling. So I'm going to mention those. Sometimes we have someone else do this uh, to give a break here, but I visited some of the people this week, and so I wanted to do this myself. 
Richard Stilp, who we've been praying for, who came to our car show a year ago, is in the hospital, and I visited him. And the cancer has now been more diagnosed, and it's there is no treatment. So I really need you to pray for Richard Stilp and his family. I got to, got to visit his daughter, Kelly. I've met his wife, Anna. So please pray for Richard. Connie Ray, as we mentioned, passed away. Um, or have we mentioned? Has it been a week? Yeah. It was, it was uh, last Tuesday. Well, the service, Dave is here today. I want you guys to comfort Dave. The service will be at Wade View Park the Saturday after Thanksgiving, November 25th at 3 p.m. Wade View Park is just west of Boone High School off Cayley. So uh, pray for good weather and come out and support Dave. Bud Self, I got to see Bud. He is in uh, rehab, getting his leg muscles strong enough so he can come home. Bud doesn't get many visitors, so please visit him. And if you want to write this down, he's at Westminster Towers at 70 West Lucerne in room 230 West, not 230 East. I found that out the hard way. The room was unlocked, and the pictures weren't Bud, and I quickly scooted out of that room, found Bud. Joe Ball's brother and, uh, and sister, uh, continued prayers are needed. Uh, Melissa George, as she fights cancer. Floyd is here today. Uh, his cancer treatments have gone less severe than he thought, and we're, we're glad for that. But Ann had to go home today in the middle of Sunday school class not feeling well. And then lastly, I understand that Carol Krasinski's son-in-law, they discovered blockage in his heart. So we need to pray for Tom, is his name? Tim. Okay. So while you're writing your cards, are there any other prayer requests? Vicki. Vicki Skirdo's brother, Harold Compton, has been diagnosed with kidney cancer. Jama. Okay. Your, Jama's dad and stepmom are older in years. There's some medical issues, and then also the issue of what's the appropriate care for them. So pray for them. Okay. Chuck did come home from the hospital this week. He's much better. He got a pacemaker in. Let's... Continue to pray for Chuck, okay? All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this community of people who share and love each other and care for each other. Um, I don't know many congregations that do this as well as they do. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to reach out and support these friends and family. Lord, I even forgot to mention Jenadette Rodriguez across the street who lost her daughter tragically several weeks back. We pray you'd comfort her. We lift all these to you. We pray that you would bless them in these difficult times of need. I especially mention Richard Stilp. Lord, I ask for a miracle there. We know your word says that you healed, and we also know that everyone you healed eventually passed away. So we pray for a healing in this place for Richard Stilp. Would you touch his body and bring a miracle in that situation? Lord, would you comfort David Ray and Zoe and Xander and Trisha as they mourn the loss of Connie. Would you be with Melissa as she fights cancer and Floyd as well? Or Carol's son-in-law, Tim. Lord, I forgot to mention my nephew, Corey and Tabitha, who are just now in their third week of grieving the loss of seven-week-old Abigail or Abby. Lord, would you bless these people? Would you touch them? And would you let them know you're near? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Okay, I'm going to give the mic to Terrence and grab another mic. And if you have a question, ushers will bring it to Terrence. Noticed. Whoops, I noticed my timer down there wasn't ever working, so... As far as I'm concerned, it's 10 a.m. and we have plenty of time left. Questions? All right, we have some pre-prepared that have been submitted by people before. And I think we have some others coming too. Terrence? Can you guys hear Terrence? Hey, yeah, definitely. need a little help there. Okay.
So last week you argued that Christianity satisfies our sense of morals and justice, that there is such a thing as objective morals. But this week you're asking us, where is our identity when we fail to live up to those moral standards? How does Christianity then ultimately support morals if you're saying we can't uphold them? Maybe a simpler way to answer this is, can Christianity give us a real desire to do good when our affirmation comes from God? I think I think that's a probably a more profound question than most of us realize. How if if we get affirmed from God and our value and we're saying no one keeps all the rules, then like what's the use? How can Christianity make us better people? I, I some people would say I'm not that old, but the older I get and the more I probe deeper in my own faith and I work with others, I am becoming absolutely convinced that my mainstream version of Christianity in the United States, and I'm going to use a strong word, is heresy. It's heresy. Because what you typically hear, what t- people typically think of Christianity, and unfortunately what you find a lot of people believing is that um, you submit your life to God, Jesus forgives you, and then you keep all the rules. And then you keep all the rules. And what happens is you have a lot of prune-faced people that are sad or self-righteous because they think they keep their rules better than the rules that you're not keeping. I go to church. I don't smoke, chew, or go out with girls that do. And I certainly don't do what you do, and so they become prideful. And now let me tell you this. When I say, does Christianity satisfy these things? Is it the most workable system? And I'm not arguing that you only believe it because it's workable. I'm trying to clear those obstacles so you can examine it's true. But when I say it explains this, Scripture shows this. I've said before that all the New Testament letters but two are addressing problems in the church because we humans mess everything up. And Paul writes to, uh, to two churches, the church uh, uh, we call the book Galatians and uh, Corinthians. So there's a church in Galatia and a church at Corinth. The church in Galatia does what I just said. They came to, to Jesus, gave their life to, them, to him, but then they go, we're going to keep all the rules. And Paul says, what in the world is wrong with you? Who's bewitched you? But then to the Corinthians, they say, we're forgiven. Ah, party, party, we can do whatever. So the question becomes, if that's the case, how does a Christian ever do anything good for society? Because if there's these sacred morals that that Tater thinks really do exist, what does Christianity do to move us in that direction? When you come to Christ, when you really submit your life to him, a change begins to happen. And sometimes you'll see instant change in some areas. And then the little by little, the longer you grow, as I said earlier, and you see more and more where you fail, you become more humble and your heart becomes softer. Now, sometimes that's really, really, really hard to see. (laughs) If you look over your life as a follower of Jesus over two weeks, it's a complete failed faith because you're doing the same thing you did two weeks ago. But if you look over two years or ten years, you see, hopefully, a softer, gentler you that's changing. So it does uphold morals but they're not morals that you keep in order to gain your identity or justification. They're morals that you do because your heart changes and you want to love God back and you have genuine care for the woman across from the street. But but it's interesting in this transition time when you're beginning to realize, you go, I want to help her, but am I doing it for her or am I doing it for me? Well, at that stage, you recognize it and you help her, but you constantly grow in less of you, more of her. So if what you are telling us is true, why are some Christians so insecure? Okay, that's that's related but more pointed. If if what we're saying is true, that we get our identity from God as his beloved, why are so many Christians insecure? The passage I mentioned earlier, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, he, he who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. 
I've shared that before here in the in the service in a recorded message. And I have a friend who fits this description. And she knows that I've used her as an illustration. And I told her I, uh, I shared this passage with her. And weeks later, uh, we're texting, and she goes, I love that verse so much. Now I'm trying to become the righteousness of God. I said, no, you're trying to earn it. You, When you accept Jesus into your heart, you become the righteousness of God. You are seen on a judicial status as Jesus and his perfection. But so many Christians, as I said earlier, are following this heretical form that says I get in the house by being forgiven, but then I stay in the house of God by keeping all the rules. And it leads to total despair. And most Christians have to grow into this over their lifetime. And that's why I shared about my journey, and that's why I'm trying to point out scriptures that say it's not instant. You know, unfortunately, the stats say most of us American Christians don't read our Bibles that much. But if we get in and read the nitty-gritty detail, take off our blinders and look, we'll see that these greatest of saints failed. Even after Jesus forgave Peter and told him to go feed my sheep, we, we read probably a decade later that he commits an ethnic sin in front of a whole group of people at church. And so the Apostle Paul has to call him out in front of everyone. You are forgiven. And then because you're forgiven, once you realize it, you become more safe and secure. And it's amazing. The more secure you become in God's life, in God's love, the more those stupid behaviors fall off one by one. What is my soul? Is it my mind, my emotions, my feelings? Does Christ satisfy what is my soul? Is it my mind, emotions, and feelings? And then does Christ satisfy? Good. That's two, qu two questions there. So I don't want to go in the weeds, but um, for the sake of this argument, uh, your soul is the immaterial part of yourself. Now, scholars argue whether there's a soul and a spirit. We won't get into that. Your soul is your mind, your heart your desires, your will, all those things mixed together. But I think the second part of the question is what's most important. Is it satisfied or what is the, can you does, read the second part? Does Christ. Does, does Christ, Christ satisfy. satisfy. Next week we're going to talk about does Christianity satisfy our sense of work. But the week after that, it's does it satisfy our sense of joy, pain, and satisfaction. And I don't want to say just come to that week. But I've tried to say all along that saying Christianity satisfies doesn't mean you stay satiated all the time. I've used the illustration of a meal. And in this world, there is suffering. And if you come from a more dysfunctional background, it may take longer to get to this. But what you see is the story explains why the world is so broken and messed up. And through observing that messed upness, Christianity is satisfy that hunger of what's wrong. But you can then also have moments where you stand with your nephew as his wife uncontrollably weeps and doesn't want to leave the graveside of the seven-week-old baby. And by the way, for us, that recalls for us losing Leah Victoria. Now, Leah Victoria wasn't born alive. She was stillborn. But we resonate with that. And the, yet, at the same time, you can get up in the morning and say, how beautiful is your God. That satisfaction grows little by little. C.S. Lewis says that this takes time. Poetry replaces grammar. Love replaces obedience. Longing replaces obedience as gradually as the tide lifts a grounded ship. And I think for a lot of us, when we're young, it's hard to see that satisfaction because we don't have a lot of life's experiences. When I was in my 20s, I thought, hey, I have the world kicked. I, I'm a Christian. I can raise kids perfectly. No, you can't. And your scripture says a seed has to die first before it can come to life. And as you grow older and see your failings, and yet God intervening in your life through it, satisfaction. 
What roles do race, gender, and sexual orientation play in determining our identity? Race, sexual identity, and gender, and what else? Uh, race, gender, and sexual <coughs> orientation. Well, we sort of have to treat those a little differently. Christianity does not say race is a moral issue, but it will say sexual choices are a, a, a moral issue. When you come to Christ, you do not cease being white or black or Latino. But over the time of your life, as your identity grows and you understand him more, being white, black, or Latino, or male or female is second to who you are as God's beloved. It becomes second to that. Now, one of the failures of the American version of Christianity is uh, shunning or shaming people who are not a traditional biblical sexual ethic. I, I really don't want to take this time to reiterate, yes, we think uh, anything outside the traditional biblical se sexual ethic is wrong. Well, people know that Christians believe that. But you're not saved based on whether or not you follow that ethic. And that's going to make some people mad. But Jesus caught the woman, caught in adultery, and said, neither do I condemn you. Now, he did tell her to stop. But your identity as a person does not come from your sexual identity. And and for those who who think this is heresy, th those who are Christians, hey, some people are born gender indistinct. It happens. And so you can't base your identity in that, but it doesn't always happen overnight. It takes time to understand the the as Scripture says, the width, the breadth, and the depth of God's love for us. Why can't we just get our affirmation from a good, safe, steady person instead of buying into the entire belief system? Why can't we just be affirmed by someone we love? Uh, unfortunately, this is a little easier to answer. What happens when that person dies? When my father-in-law passed away, my mother-in-law, um, she loved him dearly. She passed away about two years ago. She's, there's a line from a writer uh, that talks about when his mother died that Atlantis had disappeared. It had sunk and no longer to be found again. She broke down and wept and said, that's what it's like for me now that he's gone. The people that you put your affirmation in will die. They will fail you. Your children pass away. And my mother-in-law was a great example that she didn't spiral into deep, dark depression when the love of her life of I don't know how many years, how many decades passed away. And unfortunately, even a very good spouse will fail you. In fact, one of the signs in a uh, even a Christian marriage where someone doesn't get this, they're constantly trying to get affirmation from their spouse. And I've been guilty of that m before. You cannot get your affirmation from other people because they will fail you. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. That's uh, all we have time for. Um, we do need to wrap up. Uh, <coughs> now, if you're a guest today, we're about to take our, our offering where people give funds to the church. You're not asked to do that. We're more concerned that we have cleared the road for you to in investigate your journey of faith. But as the ushers come, let me just give a couple of updates for our people. Uh, last month, October, our giving was up and our expenses were down. <laughs> Finally, it cooled off a little bit, and so we had a very good month. And thank you so much for being faithful. Um, a couple months ago, Floyd did the numbers and giving was dead on track. And I, so I want to say this isn't a problem of people not giving. We just had a really hot summer and we've got some old air conditioners and uh, I've probably printed too many things on copy paper or something. So thank you for that. You didn't have to agree to me printing too much, Jama. Our capital campaign for our roof is still plowing on. The contract's been signed. The roofers will be here in December. And as soon as that's done, uh, we'll be moving on to renovate those rooms. Now is the time 
to continue to give the capital campaign fund. If you're going to give, I challenge you to make a matching gift. Even if it's $50, you can say, I won't give this until someone else matches that. And the more people give, the more people see it's working. I mean, how many of you thought we'd be in November and raised almost $26,000? And most of it from within o Oasis. I mean, all four churches are working out some plan or are giving. But over half, maybe three-quarters of the giving has come from this group alone. That's a miracle. That's a miracle. So I just want to encourage you that to keep giving. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for loving us, even though sometimes we just don't get it. I just sincerely ask God, would you help us to tell this story the best way possible? I mean, God, it's just too good to be true that you, the creator of the universe, would just rather die than to see us neurotic and wallowing in our own self-doubt. It's crazy that the creator of the universe would rather die than let that happen. So make us better at telling this story. And Lord, now as these friends give sacrificially, I pray you'd bless their homes. I pray you'd give us wisdom to spend this money. I pray you'd help it to go far to tell more people about you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Again, if you're a visitor today, our website is oasisconwaygardens.org. And the tab, uh, I'm new. You can tell us about your visit. Terrence is here. I'm here. We have others. If you'd like to meet us, we'd love to, to greet you. Thank you, and have a good week.